Uh, we'll quickly go through the history of the pipe organ and wind systems. Uh, briefly touch on the pipe organ survey that I did. Look at reservoir resonance, blower and reservoir combinations, uh, blower comparisons, blower cutoff um, uh, effect, blade frequency, blower load frequency, control valves, and attenuating devices. And hopefully we'll get that in half an hour. History of the pipe organ. This is the largest pipe organ in the world. It's in Atlantic City, America. 33,000 pipes, 815 stops. But the root of the pipe organ began in 250 BC with uh, a Greek engineer called uh, Civitus who designed this uh, contraption here. The um, pipes are pressurized by a column of water. This is similar on the right hand side to you see of Sabin's apparatus, apparatus that he used uh, in the end of um, the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s. And this has got um, octave related pipes in it. The air is pressurized using um, a column of um, water uh, inside the tank. The connection between Sabine or Sabine and the apparatus is the Symphony Hall in Boston, the, second, the new Symphony Hall, the old Symphony Hall was rebuilt uh, and this is the uh, new one with, with the organ that was originally constructed by Hutchins uh, and this is the connection between Sabine and Hutchins that um, Sabine was doing his work in 1896 to sort out the acoustics in the um, fog lecture room and um, at that time Hutchins had been commissioned to actually build a new organ for the symphony hall and at that time Hutchins had working for him Skinner who later went on to develop some quite fancy control systems for pipe organs in the early 1900s and I feel that Skinner has his hand in this apparatus that um, Sabine was using here. Um, and so there's a little bit of history there about uh, Sabine Hutchins, which is not obviously a connection. Brief history of the pipe organ wind system. We start off with this uh, system uh, on the left hand side in uh, the cathedral, about 1600, 1500. And the, the, the guys are actually walking along there, lifting those um, bellows up to pressurize the air. Very quickly, um, we went to a, a system where you've got a, at the bottom here a double rise reservoir and at the top a single rise reservoir. The top one has um, got a hand, operated handle for emergency use, but you can see there are two water engines there, so when town's water became available, they used that as the motive power to uh, pressurize the, um, the wind system. It's just worth going back to, to mention the apparatus that uh, Sabine used. In those days, don't forget, there was no loudspeakers. So he wanted a sound source and, you know, an organ pipe seemed a good idea at the time. Uh, and at the bottom we've got this... Um, double rise uh, reservoir system fed by a, a set of feeders which are connected to an crank. So this is the start of uh, electric motors coming in and, and replacing the, um, the water engines. And then we go to what most organs are driven by now, a centrifugal fan. And you can see here this is a multi-stage fan because the motors that they had in the beginning of the 1900 were eight pole motors running at 750 RPM. So they, you could only derive about two inches water gauge from each stage. So if you wanted high pressure, you'd have to put one stage into another. So you see, you start off with two inches and then we end up at 10 inches, I think. And you can see that there are two, once you move to um, a fan system, you need a cutoff valve. Otherwise you just ex explode the, the reservoir. So you can see there are two cutoff valves there. On the left hand side, you can see a roller blind and on the right hand side you can see a simple guillotine valve that's, positioned, that's connected to the top of the reservoir. So it's a bit like a ball cock. As the reservoir rises, it shuts the, the wind supply off. 
Just briefly, this double rise reservoir is quite clever because <coughs> if you look at the bottom, you can see there's two curves. One, the red one, is for inward folding ribs, and the blue one is for outward folding ribs. And if you, there's a bit of a formula there, and you can see that A is the um, area of the reservoir top, B is the plan area of the ribs. And when the ribs are at 45 degrees, the plus and minus part of the expression cancels out. So you're just left with the force on the top is, is equivalent to the pressure over the area. Or in organ building terms, what we're interested in is pressure. So pressure is equal force over area. Um, and so you can see, it doesn't matter the position of the reservoir top, it's compensating for itself by an inward folding rib and an outward folding rib. So you, the pressure stays the same and there's no pitch change. So we get on to the real thing now. What is organ pipe flutter? Well, a survey of 83 organ, uh, pipe organs <laughs> found that 50% of the organs had some form of flutter and over 39% of the sample pipes had flutter. And what we've got here on the left-hand side is effectively the old-fashioned way of doing it, a feeder-fed system. And on the right-hand side, we've got the modern way of doing it, and we've got um, a fan-generated system. I just need to find now where the cursor is. Anybody see it? It's gone. It doesn't matter, I was going to play two sound files. Oh, there we are. So that's the one on the left, which is supposed to be pretty good. And this is the one on the right. Can you hear the modulation? So the, the pipe organ survey was done to get some basic information about pipe organs. So we looked at 83 in the UK. The oldest organ was 1858. The average number of stops was 16 and a half. 70% of the organs were sited at the east end of the church in the north or south organ chambers, and the remainder were placed at the west end. Most of the buildings were deemed to be of medium size, 75%, with a reverberation time between one and three seconds almost uh, two-thirds and only one organ had non-equal temperament this is some of the information uh, that came from the survey you can see on the left hand side um, the split between uh, single and double rise reservoirs predominantly 85% of the organs had double rise reservoirs you can see um, can't see the thing myself uh, you can see that the um, reservoir height was 12 inches, which is not unusual because it's working in imperial units. The um, most common wind pressure was 3 inches. There again, that's not uncommon because we're working in inches. Um, this is the split between the various types of uh, valves. We've got the guillotine valve here, which had the, the greatest number, followed by the roller blind, and only 11% had internal valves. And on, at the bottom here, we can see the difference in blower speed. The bulk of the uh, organs had 3,000 RPM uh, motors. And this gives you the distance, uh, the average distance from the blower to the reservoir. So it was, most of them were under two meters. So the, the blowers are sighted very close. And that's probably because a lot of these blowers are replacement blowers for the hand-operated system. So they're either placed next to the organ or just inside the organ of the space. We looked at, we asked the tuners to look at four pipes varying in scale. So we've got um, an eight foot open, four foot principal, an eight foot flute and an eight foot string. So they're varying in scale. And you can see the color coding there. Green is no flutter, blue is slight flutter, um, 
that yellowish colour is medium flutter and the red is extreme flutter and that's probably just uh, a pipe that's gone off speech. So you can see that the flute tends to have more blue than the uh, others and the string has more green than the rest. And the summary of that is that you can see the string is far less, there's far less flutter found on the string and there was far more flutter found on the flute. So that scale seems to have some influence on organ pipe flutter. To proceed with this, I've built a test set up using organ building bits and pieces. So we've got a reservoir. Um, and in this case, I used um, a single riser reservoir because you can easily spring. Uh, it's very difficult to put springs on a double riser reservoir because of the, the geometry of the, the reservoir. So I, I've got this um, single riser reservoir, which is about um, 1,200 by 1,200 or 4 feet by 4 feet, um, connected to uh, a blower in an adjoining room so we could use blowers that were quite noisy as well. Um, there's the test pipe sticking out of the side of the reservoir. Um, blow can be weighted or sprung. We look at the pipe with a microphone and we look at the top of the reservoir with an accelerometer. This is uh, what the thing actually looks like and you can see the various bits and pieces. On the left hand side is the 0, 1 dB noise and measurement control uh, measurement system working in real time so you can make changes you can see exactly what's happening and on the right hand side is um, a pressure measurement so we, we look at the pressure inside the reservoir and we look at the pressure at the blower. This is a basic spectrum of the test organ pipe which is treble C so you can see all the harmonics up to 20k so second harmonic is slightly higher than the fundamental. Um, we look at, at a zoom of the fun, fundamental and you can see there are two side bands on each side of the fundamental at about 10 hertz and then we look at what's happening on the reservoir top and you can see the difference there between the feeder system in green and the lower system in red. So you can see there's a huge peak at 10 hertz which tends to suggest that the modulation is, is actually stemming from the, the reservoir top vibration. The next thing I looked at was the, pos the combinations because you can have um, weighted and sprung and you can have fast and slow. So you can have, you saw in the survey we had motors running at 3000 RPM and motors running at 1500 RPM. So this gives you a picture of the, the, the subtle difference between the two systems. The weighted system has got this 10 hertz component. So the natural frequency of the reservoir is around 10 hertz. But the sprung system, its natural frequency has moved along and it's around 20 hertz or roughly twice. So to match the blower with the, um, the reservoir, you can see that we start off at 50 millimeters and we got quite a, a low level. But the top plot is reservoir top vibration. The bottom plot is, in fact, the side bands at the maximum, which is 8 years. So you can see that we actually change the pressure. We're actually changing the resonant frequency of the reservoir. And lo and behold, at 80 millimeters, which is most popular, uh, roughly the most popular uh, wind pressure, three inches, we get this huge peak. So this effectively, this blower is tuned to three inches. This shows you the effect of damping. But, um, this is for, the same with a scope with us, a trigger. So we're looking at um, two and three eighths, I think it is wind pressure. Um, for uh, a resonant frequency uh, of the reservoir of about 16 hertz. So you can see it takes about a second 
So you give it a one shot uh, of a tenth of a second. In other words, there's a valve fitted to the side of the reservoir. You energize the valve for a tenth of a second, create a, a shock, and this is the kind of uh, response that you get. What you can do with um, a system is you can actually tune the reservoir so you can actually throw some weights off and add springs. And so you can see in this particular case here, the blue is 100% weights, and you can significantly re reduce this kind of 10 hertz component by changing um, the spring weight ratio. And at 73%, we seem to have cured some of the problems that we had before. So if you can't move, and, and many is the time that you can't move the resonant frequency because you can't change the wind pressure because all the pipes are set for one particular wind pressure. So if you've got this resonance, you want to try and move it. You've got to do something else. So one of the ways is to try and change, and move the resonant frequency uh, higher or lower. And this is um, a MATLAB script that allows you to kind of simulate um, an organ builder to put some numbers in and see what's happening. So you can actually put the mass of the reservoir here. So um, the mass of the, of the lid was 25 kgs. We measured that by drilling a hole in the bottom, sticking a prop up and lifting the lid up and putting it on a set of scales. And it worked out at 25 kg. We can change the springs on the side and we can change the area and the depth. The depth is important as well. Change the depth and you change the frequency. And this here is to do with the, the rib angle. So the rib angle's at 45 degrees. There's the sine, tan, and cosine. And so the rib pressure is zero. So as you change the rib angle, this pressure will increase or decrease whether you've got inward or outward folding ribs. And this is the stiffness here. Um, and then this is a damping factor that you can apply. And in this case, to get about one second, it's 0 0.06 damping. So you can put numbers in here and you'll see this peak here move along all over the place. And obviously, as you add more damping, the peak becomes wider. Take the damping off and the peak becomes, so you, you can alter the Q factor as well. So we've looked at the, the thing that we're exciting. Now we want to look at the thing that's exciting them. So we look at the blower comparison. So we've got four blowers here. There's um, a discus one, two BOBs, and the one on the right is a Taylor blower from Taylor. No relation to me at all. Uh, and we've also got a modern uh, Italian blower on the left there. An old kinetic blower on the right. And for a bit of fun, I tried a garden leaf blower as well. Just to say a little bit about um, fan performance. We're working in an impossible area. We're working here because we've got no flow. There's, we've got a reservoir, it's pressurized. There's no actual flow in the, the, uh, the trunk at all. And you can see that for, for the best performance, the mechanical advantage uh, gives you the minimum noise and you get this static pressure here. Most people are working this area here. We're working in this area here, so it's unknown territory. There's no data in that area at all. And this is the reason why I conducted these tests. So we look at the blower comparisons. This is the kind of physical data of the blowers. The static pressure of the eight blowers there. You can see that the leaf blower gives you quite a big static pressure. Makes a hell of a noise, but gives you a good static pressure. Um, the number of blades, some of them have got, or the three that's, the leaf blower has not got any uh, interblades. So it's quite common for people to put interblades in, which uh, have been shown to have uh, no effect at all. Uh, so, as well as the main blades, between the main blades, you've got these small little interblades. Uh, and you can see the, the various peripheral speeds. Um, I mean, a, a fan's just like a transformer, a step-up transformer. You put air in at the bottom at atmospheric pressure, and you get it out somewhere, somewhere else at a high pressure. And it's that conversion so that, that the actual 
circumference of the fan and its width is important so to actually get the volume through. And so at the bottom you can see the, the impeller width. So um, blow, look at blower 4 and blower 6 because they are the ones that produced the best results. Blower floor is, 4 is a tailor blower and blower 6 is the, um, one of the modern Italian fans. So what I was able to do, I was able to record um, the pipe using uh, um, produce a WAV file. And from that, I could analyze and see um, what the sidebands were for each, each blow and compare them with um, the frequency top vibration. Uh, interesting that every blower changes the harmonic, con the frequency content. So you change the blower and you slightly change the sound of the organ. This gives you the comparison of the eight blowers. So you can see that they, they basically fall into two groups. High speed and low speed blowers. So the, the high speed blowers produce far more res reservoir top vibration than the low speed blowers. And this compares uh, blower four and six. So you can see there's a huge difference between the Taylor blower four and the uh, Dominato blower six. And both of those are 3,000 RPM. And this shows you the percentage amplitude modulation of the two blows. There's the blow four at the top and blow six at the bottom. Cutoff. The important thing about cutoff is, and the, the relationship, there's... Um, a researcher called Liddell in about 1953, I think, produced this, this, this paper showing the effects of cutoff on the amount of noise that you get from a blower. The extreme case of this is a siren where the cutoff distance is tiny and you get a huge blade tone. So you can see there's the um, cutoff distances or the delta R over R for each blower. So you can see uh, there's several for blow 6, 6A, six, six B and C because I use different speeds. So you can see, uh, and he actually said that if you get, uh, for minimum noise, you need a, a delta R over R of something like 0.25. So you can see the tail of blow is very nearly 0.25, whereas the, the other blow is up at 0.06. And what that means is that um, if, you, if you look at one blower and you change the cutoff distance, so we're looking at um, original cutoff distance of um, 100 millimeters. This is the um, Dominato fan. You can see the huge, um, oh sorry, you can see the red peak there. It's quite, quite low. And then if we reduce the cutoff distance to 25 millimeters, you can actually see now that there is a distinct blade tone at 600 hertz. So just by changing this cutoff distance, you can actually change the, um, blade, uh, the blade frequency level. And you can see the effect that it has on the sideband modulation, it has no effect at all on what I'm looking for. So this proves that blade tone has nothing to do with pipe flutter. The slight difference is because there's a slight tuning difference between the two results, uh, which is very, very difficult when you're uh, working with organ pipes. And you can see here that how the blade frequency has changed by fitting a speed controller to uh, one of the fans. This here, you can see the peak there at 420 hertz. That corresponds with 2,100 RPM. The green at 2,400 and the blue. 20, so you can see how the all fans have some form of blade tone and it's just dependent upon what the cutoff distance is as to how prominent it is.
So you can see the blade, the blade tones here for both the Blow 4 and Blow 6. You can see the strong peak at 500 hertz on the left hand plot. And you can see that on the right hand plot there's not much at 600 hertz. Which is the one with the 0.6 delta R over R. That many facets, I said we were working in this area where no one tends to go, very low frequency. And so with the microphone inside the reservoir, you can see the difference between the two, um, between the one on the left-hand side and the one on the right-hand side. This is with the reservoir down, the red, so the path from the reservoir to the blower is clear. The control valve is open. The blue is with the reservoir valve, sorry, with the reservoir up and the valve closed. So you can see the difference. The, the reservoir kind of acts as an attenuator, but you get these, these peaks here. And you can see here they're in line. So that's why the blower is effectively matched to the resonant frequency uh, of this reservoir. And this shows you the comparison of the, um, the, the reservoirs, sorry, the, the, the blowers. So the bottom, the blue is in fact the, the, the natural frequency of the reservoir, which is 10 hertz roughly. The red is the frequency or and level of the, um, each blower. So you can see blower 6 coincides with the natural frequency of the reservoir, and the others are slightly higher or lower. And at the top, you can actually see the, uh, the actual value uh, of um, the SPL. So you can see that blower 6 is far higher than the rest. Control valves. One thing about the, the pipe organ survey that, that came forward was that quite a few of these organs that should have had flutter didn't. And so I then started to look at control valves. This is the control valve that's in the internal control valve that's fitting in that reservoir, which is a simple monkey's tail uh, pallet valve. And then I looked at the other two control valves. On the left-hand side is a guillotine valve, which is just a simple gate valve. And on the right-hand side is the roller blind valve. And the results were quite interesting. That Reservoir top vibration was substantially less for the guillotine valve and roller blind and far more for the internal valve, which is not surprising because effectively the guillotine valve and the roller blind cut the path off between the reservoir and the blower. So effectively all the sound is reflected back. Whereas with the guillotine valve, um, you can uh, get slight amount of uh, air past it and it will have its own natural frequency, which is about 30 hertz as well. So that's not surprising. Then took this one step further and installed a couple of gate valves and progressively closed the gate valve. So one gate valve closed, uh, or sorry, two gate valves open, one gate valve closed, one gate valve partially closed, and slowly you get to this situation here so you can see this curve at the bottom. So if you close both valves and let the reservoir slowly settle down, you almost get no flutter at all, or no reservoir top vibration. And you can see at the top, there's the reservoir vibration levels and the sideband levels. So they've almost disappeared. Commercial silencers, the last part in the, um, the link. So we've looked at the reservoir, we've looked at the blower, we've looked at the control valve. So there's a, this bit of duct between the blower and the reservoir. So there's a possibility of fitting some form of attenuating device in there. So these are popular commercial devices. Um, and at the bottom there, you can see the frequency uh, spectrum of the attenuation of these devices. So there's no data where I want to be at 10 hertz. Most of it only goes down to 60 hertz, 63 hertz or 50 hertz at the best. So, uh, I constructed several organ building attenuating devices. On the left-hand side is what organ builders would loosely call as a, an attenuating, an anti-turbulent device. 
Um, the one on the top is a plenum chamber, small plenum chamber. In the middle, you've got the duct silencer. And then at the left is the small uh, pepper pot silencer, and on the right is the, the larger one. And so we, I looked at these, and particularly for what I'm looking at, is the 10 hertz area. They all are pretty good at uh, sorting out um, breakout noise that you would get in the, the duct. You can see the, this is reservoir top vibration, so you can see down to 100 hertz, pretty flat, and then you get a little bit there. The blue is, in fact, without any intervention. Uh, the duct silencer is much and much the same. This is um, 1,200 millimeters long, uh, and there's various kind of linings there, so you can actually have perforated hardboard or perforated metal. A small uh, circular silencer uh, is a circular silencer, but the, the internal pipe is perforated metal surrounded by mineral wool. And this starts to do something. At this level, you're not really looking at silencers, but you're probably more looking at what I would call a damping device, something that's actually damping out the air. And the best results came with this pepper pot uh, silencer here. So you can see the purple. Uh, it's substantially uh, less than anywhere else. And that gives pretty good results. And you can see, um, looking at it from uh, reservoir top vibration again, and um, modulation, that the, the top one is without the silencer, and the bottom one is with the silencer. So it's substantially better. So what next? Well... Austin, in um, about 1880, they came up with this universal wind chest. And they had three types, walking, crawling, and panels on the bottom. This is a walking chest. So this is what they call the vestibule door. So you go in, and there's an airlock there. This is pressurized. This is the action here, and there's the pipework. And this is the wind control. And um, these give exceptionally good flutter-free um, pipework. So much so that you can't excite the air by a normal tremulant. So they have to have specially designed and constructed fan tremulants, which is a long blade turning around to actually create this tremulant effect. So based on this, and you can see here that the, the mass is kept down to an absolute minimum because the... The reservoir is, in fact, vertical. So taking on board some of the ideas of, uh, of this, constructed flutter baking machine Mark II, which is a little three-rank uh, extension organ. And you can see there's the vertical um, compensator there at the bottom, connected to the blower. Um, there are three, three ranks of pipes, so you've got a string, a flute, and uh, a diapason, so you can look at those individually in detail. Uh, and this is the pan here, so there's the accelerometer fastened to the pan. And at the bottom, you can see a bracket there with a, a, a small uh, circular piece of bar sticking out with a piece of threaded rod on it. There. And it's... The eccentricity of that rod is six millimeters. That's all. And the idea is if you can create flutter free wind, then somehow you should be able to excite it. And this is the easiest way to excite it. So you can see this graph here. The red is, in fact, without the motor turning. And the blue is, in fact, with the motor turning. So that six millimeter eccentricity of that six millimeter rod is sufficient to produce at its natural frequency that huge peak there. So what you can actually do is you can now use this by just changing the extension on that rod. You can actually produce definable amounts of flutter. 
And the next thing, the most important thing, is I'm going to complete 10 garden <laughs> railway coaches. And these are six of them. Thank you very much. Well, have we got any questions? Yes. Uh, is what a uh, good or bad thing in uh, a normal pipe? I, I wouldn't like to say that because we, we all, it's there and most people just accept it. But if you were going to design a uh, most people from scratch, would you would you try and avoid it? Yeah, you you do try and you do try and get rid of it. I mean, it, the, the the problem about flutter is that it affects tuning because if you're trying to tune two notes and listen for beats, especially if one of the notes might be four k, and the next note above it is eight k, the last thing you want is is little beats there because you want to try and get the tuning exact. Uh, and the problem is, as, as, as you go away from the, the, the pipes, um, the flutter becomes less, or sometimes it doesn't even exist in the body of the church. That's why we asked in the organ survey to, to give their uh, consideration, uh, their, their opinion of flutter at the soundboard and in the body of the church as well. So is this something that, that organists complain about? Or is, or is this they will do. <laughs> it's something that I think most organ builders are aware of, and it, I might not be liked by organ builders eventually because this is something that the advisors, consultants might latch onto and, and start. I mean, the, the, the finicky people, anyhow, so it may well be that this may be something that they might latch onto. I, I, what, what, what you need is you need a balance because the, the tremulum, which I've not talked about, which is just extreme flutter, you need some kind of give in the wind system to get the tremulant going. I mean, the problem is that there's only really one sweet spot for a tremulant, and, and it may not be the speed that people want. Four hertz is kind of taken as, as the natural level for amplitude modulation for people. And most in the organ survey, most of the tremulants came out around four hertz. Um, so, and that's why the Austin Universal Wind Chest, y you can't shake the wind, so you've got to put external fan operated tremulants which just kind of waft the wind, uh, or the, the, the sound for a better word. So where, where does the flutter actually come from? Is it a kind of an unstable flow or is it acoustic uh, kind of uh, energy which excites structural resonance in the reservoir? Or is it well, there's no, first of all, there's no flow. That's the, that, that's the, the key that we're working. There's the, the, there is actually no flow in the system. We're pressurizing the reservoir and all that the reservoir is doing is driving a small pipe and that pipe's taking no wind at all. There's a little bit of leakage through the seams of the reservoir. So there's no flow. That's the first thing. What you find is that, up from those uh, plots there, is that there is this kind of low frequency in all blowers. Most people don't. It's not there for most people because you can't hear it. No one's, been, uh, no one's gone to loop for it apart from me. And that's, that low frequency around 10 hertz is the one that excites the reservoir and so what you want to try and do is if you can and you don't know because uh, all that blower manufacturers are interested in doing is selling you a blower that will give you the capacity that you want at the wind pressure that you want they're not interested in the quality of the wind and this is something that's quite new um, that we're now looking at quality and not quantity Just ask a quick one. Yeah. What did you mean by eccentricity of the rod? Is that like how much it's screwed in? Or yeah. Oh. One one side is slightly out farther than the other side. Right. So if the rod was equal on each side, hopefully it wouldn't produce any any effect. Right. 
and the mortar was spinning around at the resonant frequency uh, of the reservoir. And, and you, you could obviously make it vibrate slower, but you need a bigger weight. And so that's what I was uh, investigating as well, uh, having a big weight and making it shake. Uh, and the, uh, this doesn't mean that the blower that I used is a bad blower. It's just that that blower nicely fits into exciting the reservoir at the frequency that I wanted to excite it, about 10 hertz. Because you're dealing with it's 10 hertz is kind of you think very low frequencies, would there be any kind of opportunity to do like a, like a control? You're measuring the response on the top of the, uh, the reservoir, actively cancelling out the, the flutter. <laughs> The problem is that you, you can't use any acoustic fixes because the, it's mass generated. But you could have one of those eccentricity kind of generating... Things. Possibly, yeah. I mean, that would be difficult to kind of get it... Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not solving the problem. <laughs> the, the secret is to make... Or a shaker of some sort, you might have more control. Yeah, you could probably do it, but you've got to appreciate that these things are, are craft built and the control valves are, are pieces of craft, not engineering in some respects. The, the double rise reservoir is clever and that's been around a long time and people are reluctant to go away from it in some respect. Uh, modern organs like the one down at um, Manchester Cathedral, they've got modern chess regulation. I'm doing some work uh, with someone uh, at the moment about chest regulation because uh, you've got other problems there you, you're into the kind of 20 hertz you're into you've got this this area of, of roughness as well that you're getting into once you get it over 15 hertz you, it, it becomes less this kind of fundamental amplitude modulation but, but roughness which is different I mean there's a whole load of uh, listening tests that you could do if someone could actually hear what we're talking about and I find it very, very difficult now. Okay, I think we'd better wrap up. Thanks very much, Alan. Thanks okay. For